Uh, it, it feels wonderful to be here on this bright and beautiful and brisk Sunday morning. Um, I was just discussing it, so nice to be able to uh, uh, make music in person. Uh, that being said, we're not totally back to normal yet. As we all know, um, it's going to be a long haul. There's a lot of endurance, and I know we're, we're all working at it. Um, I want to make a, a couple quick announcements. First, uh, there are still volunteers needed for Sunday morning screenings. Um, so we need to check temperatures and help see people, that sort of thing. Um, since uh, there is no fellowship call today, if you could call the church office for the week and let them know if you're interested or available to help with screenings. Um, it's not a terribly hard job, but it's a super, super important job at the moment. Um, another couple things, I know this is such a thing, I've mentioned this before, we are a musical congregation, it's one of the things I love about us, but it is not safe to do group singing yet. So still, for right now, please sing with your hearts and your minds, but not your actual voices. Um, Jeff is good, Pastor Jeff's going to talk about this too, but at the end of the service, um, remain seated for a little bit, we'll have a closing benediction, we'll close our online uh, service. Uh, and then Pastor Jeff will excuse one row at a time. So just kind of hang out where you are until Jeff gives you the uh, that you can do that. So, thank you. Oh, <laughs> 
reading about that and seeing how that all began after the formation of the church and the sending out of the disciples, it didn't take all that long for the world to sort of consolidate. Right? Jesus shook things up a little bit and uh, the dust sort of settled and we got a little comfortable. When we saw the birth of the, the Roman Empire, the growth of the Roman Empire, this empire sort of expanded the church with it and we had this feeling at the time that this empire was invincible. And then when the empire crumbled, the church was left to stand on its own. No longer could it sort of ride the coattails of the empire, expanding the gospel to the world. It had to stand on its own and bring the message of hope to the world. Essentially like it did in the beginning. It stood on its own, and the feet of the disciples single-handedly took the message of hope into the world. About 500 years later, the church that had sort of grown back up and been reformed, it would have a uh, major split schism over some doctrinal differences and dividing the, the faith, which was for the most part unified. Another 500 years later, we have, of course, the Protestant Reformation, which we uh, urges us to return to the basic doctrinal truths of the scriptures and away from the selfish practices. Of man. Of course, Luther was addressing uh, indulgences and, and some things that we had done to stray from the simplicity of the message of hope and of the gospel. It's worth noting that that was about 500 years ago. Just over. So, if we're keeping with traditions, if we're keeping with this pattern, we are due for a reformation. Now, over the last several months, seemingly everything about the world has changed. For better or worse is yet to be determined. We'll have to wait and see how that sort of shakes out. But nonetheless, we are in need of a reformation. Every reformation must evaluate two major elements, every church reformation that is. We look at our orthodoxy and our orthopraxy, our right belief and our right practice. Now, I honestly think that as a church we do a pretty good job uh, with our orthodoxy. I don't think any of us, uh, well, we can't claim to have a perfect understanding of the scriptures. You know, that's that's a, a perfect knowledge that is beyond all of us. Uh, all that said, I do think that we do a pretty good job of what we have. It's always been my practice to let the scriptures speak for themselves. Uh, we have been faithful in observing the full counsel of the word of God. And even the seemingly obscure parts, we leave nothing out. We're faithful to let the text speak to itself. We allow the Holy Spirit to give us the wisdom He would have us glean from. And I think it's interesting as we've been going through the book of Acts, there have been many times throughout this past year where there have been temptations to perhaps step away from Acts for a moment to address something going on in the world. But when we stay the course in Acts, what I've found is that the text, each and every time, hits those exact issues. This is as if God was saying, Look, you don't need to make your own mind, just follow mine. I've already got this covered. And His Holy Spirit gives us the wisdom that we need at exactly that moment. God has been faithful at every turn of the gate. So, the core values of the Reformation were these five solas. These are uh, the concise summary of our faith. It's not a comprehensive or exhaustive uh, you know, theology. It's, it's it's a concise summary of our faith down to these five points. And while many of you likely know these by heart, I believe it would do us all good to simply review them and be reminded of them once more. Now, I've told you before last year that I will present them in an order that may be different to you. Sometimes we're going to have a set order that we go through, and I present them in an order that I believe helps us to understand how they connect with one another uh, more more simple, more easily understood. So if, if my order is different from yours, um, I'm wrong, that's okay. Keep trying. So first and foremost, we know sola scriptura. Scripture alone, the Bible alone is our highest authority. Everything that follows sola scriptura has been revealed to us in the scriptures. This is the source of our, our holy scriptures that we have, each and every one of us. We live in a blessed time, a blessed nation, where we have access to the scriptures. We uh, we can carry it in our pockets everywhere we go. This is our only source of truth. 
Even Block himself states in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Everything that we believe should be in accordance with the Scriptures. This leads us to the next of the solas. Solus Christus, Christ alone. Salvation is through Christ alone. Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, and our King. There is no other. It was His shed blood freely given on the cross that paid the penalty of our sins and made us righteous before God when we had no righteousness of our own. And I've quoted this before, but I will again quote John Edwards. I love his, his statement You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. It is Christ alone that brings salvation. Our hope and glory is through Christ alone. Brings us to sola gratia, grace alone. We are saved by the grace of God alone. Grace is a gift freely given that is not deserved. Freely given is not deserved. It is the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. And where salvation is offered to us through grace, it is received through faith, which brings us to sola fide, faith alone. But this is sort of the reason I put them in this order. Christ alone, salvation extended by grace alone, received by faith alone. We are saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ, where salvation is extended to us in grace, which is received by faith. We believe the words of the scriptures and the promises of God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith. You see how there's two kind of tie right there in the scripture. We've been saved um, uh, by grace through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, that no one should boast. And all of this is for a purpose. Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. All of this is for the glory of God. Our redemption is for the purpose of glorifying God, and as the redeemed, we live our lives to bring Him glory. So we have this sort of circular pattern. We have a uh, solo scripture, which honestly stands on its own, sort of sits a part of this circle. It is the basis by which we know everything else. We know that salvation is from Christ alone, is extended to us by grace alone, received by faith alone, for the purpose of glorifying God alone. And the circle repeats and repeats and repeats. God continues to save, He continues to redeem, and He continues to be glorified in His redemptive work. Now, we can certainly spend a lot more time on these truths, but these points are not where I feel like we need a reformation. I feel like we have a pretty good agreement and understanding on these points. As I mentioned earlier, I don't believe we have a major problem with right belief or orthodoxy. I believe that our changes lie in our right practice, our orthopraxy. And this year has changed the way that we do everything. And so we must once again evaluate ourselves to see if we are reacting accordingly to the changing landscape of this world in order to be faithful to our Great Commission purpose. Now I want to clarify for a moment that I'm not suggesting that we be changed by the world. The faith practices of this church will not bow to the demands of culture or any powers that be. I want to make that very clear. We are wearing masks, we are spreading apart, we are limiting our attendance and adherence to policies that have been set for us, but this is for the safety of our members and the safety of our community. But these are not matters of faith. These are matters of convenience. These are not matters of faith. They can tell me that I have to preach to a mask, but they'll never tell me that I cannot preach in the name of Jesus, or that I cannot preach the word of God. On that we will not watch. This world does not change our faith. So what do I mean? Well, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, which I, I hope that you have, we haven't gotten out of the practice of bringing our Bibles to church, I hope. Uh, unfortunately, we can't have them in the pews for, for a saving reason, but um, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and pull those out. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to take a look at how Paul describes a similar dilemma. Beginning in verse 19, he says this. 
For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Verse 19 again, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. I want to point out, Paul makes very clear here that he does not have to do any of this. There is no obligation on him to change the way he exercises his faith and personal practices. He has no obligation. He is free from all. But he remembers his purpose. He remembers the reason why he was saved. To bring others to a saved knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so to do that, he makes himself a servant to all. He chooses to become a servant to all. He's under no obligation to change things that he chooses to do to be effective in his calling. Even though Paul is a changed man, he was still born a Jew. If we continue on, it says, To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, even though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. So Paul, even though he had sort of moved on in his faith, he was still, by birth, a Jew and understood he had his common ground with the Jews. He could relate to them on that front. But he mentions those under the law, specifically from the Jews. The obvious reason the two kind of go one uh, t- together hand in hand, but uh, they're usually one and the same. But not always. And so he clarifies that he's uh, on common ground with them by birth and by faith. And where they may not have differences is perhaps there's someone under the law that is not Jewish by birth who understands where they're coming from and who can relate to them on that common ground. So, nevertheless, he can find common ground no matter which side of the fence they were on on that one. He continues on to say, To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside. The law. Here again, Paul turns to the Gentiles. We've seen this over and over in the book of Acts. We've watched this progression of Paul's ministry to the Gentile world. But it's important to note here that as he references those outside the law, he makes a point to mention that he is, that does not mean he is flawless. He is not without rules. He is not without structure. He is not without a, a governing uh, rule in his life. He is under the law of Christ. And that includes us here today, though we are not under the law, as we know in the, the Old Testament, we are under the law of Christ. We follow Christ. Our standard and our example is Jesus. And that is who we follow. To the weak I became weak, that I am the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I want to point something out here. Finishing his message. You'll notice at no one time he says that he became strong to reach the strong. He says, I became weak that I may reach the weak. Just want to tell you it's because there's no saving the strong. It's a bold statement. But there's no saving the strong. You see, salvation comes through surrender to Christ. We must become weak in order to be saved. The strong will not bow to another. And those who cannot submit to the Lordship of Christ cannot be saved. We must all be humble. We've all been through that journey. We must become weak to come to the Lord. But at every turn in this passage, Paul makes this important distinction. He gives a reason why he does these things. He tells the changes that he makes to reach these people, but he gives a very specific reason why he does these things. He does it so that he might win some, so that he might save some. And this right here is the heartbeat of our commission. This right here is the metric of our success as a church. Are we being effective for the kingdom? Are we winning some to Christ? And if that answer is no, then something has to change because we are failing 
out on a mission. In the book of Mark, chapter 7, Mark notes the words of Jesus in a conversation that he has with the Pharisees. The Pharisees had noticed that the disciples were not washing their hands in accordance with the purification traditions that they had, and they make accusations against the disciples that they're eating with unclean hands. They question Jesus about his disciples and their behavior. Jesus says this, beginning in verse 6, in Mark chapter 7. And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy when he prophesied, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to, to the tradition of of men. I want to encourage you to examine your ministry here today. Your great commission and calling. Are you winning some in your life? Are you saving some in your personal ministry? Have we forsaken the commandment of God to hold on to, to the traditions of men? Now the dust is still settled in the world around us. Might still be settling for some time to come. But I want to promise you this. We will be faithful to our call. And that may mean making some changes in the way that we do things. In fact, I'm certain that it will. But my commitment to God is greater than my commitment to any traditions or comforts that we have. When we look at the early church, the faith costs the disciples something. They gave up their comforts here on this earth to gain for themselves a reward in heaven. We have to ask ourselves, what are we willing to give up? What are we willing to change? What are we willing to become so that we, we might win some for Christ? Now, in just a few moments, we'll have a closing hymn out uh, after I leave us in a word of prayer. And again, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, I will be releasing you via road. Uh, so please... Don't make a man dash to the door or anything like that. I will release you by rather than happens. But before we do that, I just want to say a few words to those who are joining us online. So for those who are, you, you should know, but if you're not aware, we are a church divided in location, but united in Christ. You see, we have viewers at home, members of our Jewish church body that are tuning in right now, and this is a wonderful opportunity to uh, worship together, but we also have guests that we perhaps will never meet face to face this side of the world. And to them, we've had to change some things. We have had to uh, make some adjustments. We have had to become things so that we might win some. And to them, I want to say this. You're worth it. You're worth it. You are worth making changes for. Whether you remember tuning in or a guest, I want you to know this. I love you. This church loves you. And most of all, Jesus loves you. And to you at home, and the Lord bless you and keep you. And I'll see you next week. Can you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day that you have given us. Lord, it is a blessing to be back in your house. It is a blessing uh, to see so many wonderful faces that we have uh, dearly missed. But Lord, we know that your work is only beginning in the life of this church. Your work is only beginning uh, across this world. You are continuing to reform us. The church reformed is always being reformed. Lord, we pray that you would help us to reform, to be effective, Lord, like a, a knife that continually needs sharpening, Lord, we pray that you would be continually adapting us to be effective for your kingdom purposes, Lord, we are not changed by the world, we will never move our, our understanding of you, our theology, we will never change our doctrines, Lord, we are not changed by the world, Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to change for the world that we might be willing to move so that we may win some for your glory, that we may save some for your glory. We know that it is you that does the winning and the saving. We know that it is your Holy Spirit that goes before us. It is you 
that has the redemptive work in their life. But Lord, we want to be effective messengers and faithful to the calling that you have placed on our lives and on this church. And so Lord, we pray that you just uh, prompt each and one of our hearts that there are areas in our life in which we have become rigid, areas in our life in which we have forsaken your command for traditions. Lord, if we've gotten comfortable, I pray that you would shake our hearts, shake our very foundation. And Lord, we know that you've done that quite a bit this year. But Lord, if we need more, keep shaking. Never give up on us, Lord, because we want to be faithful to you. Help us to be usable. Help us to be an instrument. Help us to be a tool for your kingdom and your glory. And Lord, we ask all these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.